It was reported that Joe Biden was having a medical emergency on Air Force One. Um, this is from a uh, news organization called Liveman. And one of the more reliable news sources, AP News, reported that this was completely false and Joe Biden did not have a medical emergency on Air Force One. This shows the great uh, tool that random news organizations can use to spread lies. And when you see that uh, article from Liveman and you don't fact check it or use other sources, you might just believe that it's true. Um, so an example, or the dangers of this disinformation include the erosion of trust. You see that you're not gonna trust many news organizations anymore after seeing that and not fact checking it. And as I showed on the previous graph, the polarization of not trusting in the media is extremely growing. Republicans are extremely down, and uh, Democrats believe it just a little bit more, but both are extremely down. So misinformation, um, this example is from Fox News, and just by looking at it, you might not think there's many think anything wrong with it. There's actually a typo in the graph. So that 75% for Michigan is actually 47%. They had a typo and broadcast that live. So accidental, yes, um, but it can still create a big gap in misinformation. And if that just spread around, it shows, yeah. it's a drastic change for the presidential race. So we're gonna talk a little bit, Cole's gonna talk a little bit about the importance of polling and how important polling can be. <coughs> Okay, so why, why are we talking about polling? Why does, why does polling matter? It matters because I have my thoughts, my opinions on who I'm gonna elect, what my favorite policy positions are, but what I think doesn't matter in the, in the broader context of the entire country. So I, I care about what the whole country believes on certain issues, the approval ratings for which presidential candidate or certain specific topics like maybe abortion or gun control or crime. And so it forces us all out of our bubbles to look at empirical science and see how that, how that is different from what we believe. But can we, can we even trust the polls? Like you see Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, those numbers weren't typos, but how can we, how can we trust these statistics? At first, it's important to know how polls are made. So first, they get the population, they get a large group, then they get a smaller sample from that population, and then they analyze, they interpret, they decide, they figure out what the answers are that they get from that topic, or from that sample. And so first, there's the population. Get more specific about it, it's a complete group of people that pollsters, which are the polling organizations, that they get their data on. So this could range anywhere from all Americans, as small as just people in King County who are Asian and over the age of 65. So it could be very specific, it could be very broad, but in the context of presidential elections, the population is usually all adults, registered voters, and likely voters. And so likely voters, it's not black and white, like if someone is an adult or child, if someone's registered or not registered, if someone's likely, a likely voter, that's, that's different in many different polling organizations. Like for Gallup, as an example, they, ask, they go through a screening process to figure out who's a likely voter out of all these other people. So some of the, some of the questions they would ask involve asking if on a scale of one to 10, how likely you are to vote. If you vote in the past, if you know where to go cast your ballot. So questions like that to siphon out the the, the registered voters, the all adults, to get a more accurate, to get, to get a more accurate group that's more similar to the actual <coughs> results. So there's also CNN, a key research center. They have their own different methods. And as you can see here, this is data from 2014 midterm polls for both of them. So the CNN, they got their likely voters from, from a poll on registered voters, and they found 58% of likely voters from those, that big group of registered voters. But the research center, they found 75%, which is a far greater number. So the different rules, the different types of screening processes have, are very different, are very different between different polling organizations. No matter how trustworthy or untrustworthy they are, they're just, they're just different. 
and it gets more, it gets different accuracies in actual results of what the polls are and what the polls show. So what news organizations, just like imagine if you had that 58%, you had that 75%, if they were able to show what it, likely voter actually means, if they actually showed how a registered voter or how all adults might deviate from what the actual results are. And so after you determine who that population is, then you capture the sample. Like you dip into the population, you take out a small chunk of people, and that's supposed to reflect on the entire population. That small sample, what the data you get from that is supposed to tell you what that whole population says. So about one fourth of the polls are conducted through cold calling, which yeah, it's the it's the people who call you and you pick it up, you see it's like a random number, or maybe it's spam, and then you hand it up and just put it back in the pocket. Uh, that's that's most people now. Back in 1997, uh, one third of people actually picked it up and answered the survey, but now it's only six percent. So I'm, I'm actually I'm curious. Does anyone here like pick up the phone? And cold call or to the cold calling answering the surveys. Oh, you raise your hand. Oh, you do. Oh, yeah. right, nice, nice. Well, you. Well, so you're if you're the only person, then you represent this whole room of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Can I just mention that I get three a day? You get three a day. Three wow. a day. Wow. For surveys. That's crazy. It's all different numbers. I don't right? click links. Oh. Period. Man, that's crazy. You know, so this polling thing is. I don't know, so maybe they're just like calling certain people more often. So maybe that makes even worse, even worse of a, a polling method or a sample method. Yeah. So yeah, this is what I'm saying. This is very distorted because it only represents like six percent of people. But then there's other other methods. Like what Pew Research does is they do what's called online random polls, and the response rate they get from their method is ninety percent, which is so much greater than six percent. It's so much more representative of the entire population is what their, what their sample is. So what, what news organizations, what they could do is be more, be more truthful on what methods, on what sample methods were used. If it was online random polls, if it was cold calling, like put that right next to the, those big percentages you saw from the, the TV screens, those big percentages. Get more into the details of what those sample methods were and maybe how, how accurate those are compared to others. If it's the best method, if it's the worst method. And then finally, we interpret and analyze the data. Or you take the data from that sample and you, you read it and you analyze it, you figure out, you figure out what it means, you figure out what answers we can take away from it. So going back to this poll, it's between Biden and Trump in last May. And we're gonna go off of like Arizona. Biden has 42%. Uh, Trump has 49%. <clears throat> but let's just say if this, this poll was taken on the same day as the election, they just did an election right there, and Biden gets 46%, or let's say Biden actually doesn't get 42%, but gets 38%. Like, can we say the poll's wrong? Do people walk away from this poll and see the election results? And are they, are they allowed to say, would the, bolster, would the bolster say it's wrong? And the answer is, surprisingly, no, even if it's well, very far from like the actual 42%, uh, because of the thing called the margin of error. And as you see, like very small down here, there's a 4.2, a plus or minus 4.2% right by Arizona. And what that means is that, well, you know, the people, the people watching whatever is on TV, they see all these numbers, but when you see that margin of error, what pollsters see is actually these two bar plots. You see Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And the significance with this is you still you still get the 42% and the 49%. But when you put in the margin of error, you add you add the 4.2% and then you subtract 4.2%. And then what a pollster would say about this shaded region is that when you put in when you put in the margin of error, like they're saying that they're 95% sure, they're 95% confident that with this poll, with all the data they got, that Joe Biden got between 37.8 and 46.2%, somewhere in this large range. And so theoretically, as you can see, um, like if you, in the shaded region, right, as Donald Trump goes down, 
and behind it goes up, there's a little bit of an overlap right here. So you know, it could still fall within the 95% confidence. It could still fall within both margins of errors and still have Biden win 46 to 45%. And which is very different, very different from what we saw back here, where it seemed like Trump had a 7% lead. It seemed like he was basically guaranteed to win, or at least that's what it seems like on here. So that, that's an issue, though, because if news organizations are leading people to believe that this poll basically like, guarantees uh, Trump a victory, even though polls aren't necessarily saying that, even though by the, by the pollsters' rules, Biden still has a perfectly good chance right here like there needs to be, there needs to be more transparency. We need to see, like in news, there's a need for more bar plots like this, than something a bit more, uh, something a bit more simple, something a bit more in your face, big numbers that might catch people on a bit faster, but just isn't as isn't as true as this would be. So coming away from this, like should we should we trust polling at all? I think it's important to remember that it's still like Trump polling is like the best thing we have. It's not 100% perfect. Even with that last example, there's still a 5% chance that it goes above or below that huge range. But it, like I said, it's, it's, it's the best thing we've got. The real problem though is the news organizations that take, that take uh, data, that take sampling and polls, and take that 95% truth that, that these polls like, actually have, and they claim when they claim it's 100% truth, or that it's this objective thing that we all have to that we all have to look at and see as objective fact. Like in, in reality, news organizations get further and further from the truth because even that's even that's a lie. And it can even get to the point where we're just completely false. We take we take polls completely out of context. We use the worst uh, the worst uh, methods of sampling. We use the worst population. We just take all adults, whether or not they're actually voting. And we could just completely lie and just be completely false. But the way we can get around that is by being transparent, by being honest. When telling, when news tells people what the polls say, they also have to tell what the polls mean. And it's, you know, it's not always gonna make everyone happy. It's not always gonna make people feel better about the news. But it's it's honest, and if news organizations strive to they, they strive to be more honest, and yeah, they they strive they strive to tell the truth. And that's what at least what a load of good news organization would be. So I'm gonna oh we got one more side sorry. So here's here's some things that we could do as an organization. We could educate the public on critically evaluating information so, uh, sources and distinguishing between credible and unreliable information. We can encourage people to do their own research on information, teach them how to distinguish credible sources from less credible sources, and we could even tell them to look at multiple sources, get from some different viewpoints, let them come to their own conclusions. And I'm gonna to talk to, I'm gonna bring this back to Dawson, and he's got something exciting to show you guys. So thank you, Cole. Um, one of the big projects that me and Cole have been working on all summer is called ACE Media. And at CAC, this is how we're going to help try to combat mis- and disinformation. So ACE Media is going to come out later, later this summer into early fall. Why do we choose ACE Media? First of all, the pillars of CAC are advocacy, community empowerment, and education. And we are going to use those pillars as pillars of ACE Media as well, and build upon them. So I'm going to read ACE Media's mission statement here for you. Our mission extends beyond merely reporting news. We aim to advocate for and empower our community. Starting with our comprehensive news reporting, we strive to engage, educate, and inform the public. Through our dedicated efforts, we seek to create a community that is well equipped to make knowledgeable decisions and take meaningful actions. So we are going to try to do the hard work for you and report factual, correct news by doing our own research and finding factual reporting. So some of the principles that ACE Media is going to be built upon is accuracy and fairness. Um, we want to commit to the highest standards of journalism integrity, report all sides of a story accurately and fairly without misinforming or disinforming the public. We also want to be fully transparent where we get our information from and accountable to that, the sources that we use. 
this is something that some news organizations don't really take that seriously, and I think it needs to be brought back for sure. Another one is diversity, equity, and inclusion. We want to represent all voices in the community and tell a wide variety of different stories to represent the entire community that we serve. And we want to, like Jack was saying, CAC's core values of truth, trust, free expression, and full engagement. We want to use those on ACE Media to fully broaden our horizon and report on factual, correct news stories. So where are we going to share these stories? First of all, we're going to use a website called Substack, where we're going to have multiple contributors with a wide variety of experiences. Um, this picture is just an example of what our Substack could look like. Um, the Substack will produce about one to two articles every week and keep the public updated on local and national news stories. Uh, it's going to house multimedia, so videos, infographics, photos, and a podcast that will be coming out later this year. And we, our big one is our newsletter. So this is the first early edition of our newsletter. The full edition will be coming out August 29th. And if you donate or fill out a pledge card tonight, you will be getting our early edition for our newsletter. So we're gonna have our one newsletter each summer, or each season, for summer, fall, winter, and spring. And it's gonna have big stories from the past couple of months and large investigative projects. So our feature on this uh, season's newsletter is going to be called New Tips Sparking a Call for Reform, talking about the new tips in King County and the surrounding areas. So we want AS News to be engaging. We will tell stories our community want to hear by sourcing directly from the community. It's going to be educational. We will educate the public on important local and national news stories. Empowering, empowering the community to take action into their own hands and support change they want to see. Accurate, reporting on accurate and correct facts in all our stories. It's gonna have a local focus, focusing on reports from around the local community and bringing back local journalism um, for surrounding communities. And it's going to be student driven. Stories found by students and led by students. So we're looking for um, any comments or maybe any credit you have or um, advice you have for stories we can tell from Ace Media to put on our newsletter and Substack. And me and Claude have been working on this project for all summer basically, so we're very excited about it. Thank you. So, uh, one thing I just like to add uh, is any uh, any person in the room who chooses to make a contribution to CAC tonight, uh, either through a direct contribution online, we had our QR code up earlier, we'll put it back up at the end, uh, or we do accept cash and checks. Kathy Koch, if you could just quickly identify yourself. Uh, she's got the envelope. So anyone that fills out a pledge card or makes a donation tonight will receive a free copy of the early edition of the Everyday Democracy newsletter. So uh, for this next bit, I'm going to invite up our law clerks. Uh, please participate actively when they uh, invite you to. Um, I am going to ask that uh, substantive questions and you know more discussion-provoking part wait till the end. Let's let them get through their content, and then we'll open the floor up at the end of the uh, presentations. All right? Thanks.
third year law school student at UIC. I originally joined CAC this summer, and the reason why I was very compelled to join CAC is because they do a lot of community lawyering and some constitutional issues there, which is an area of law that I'm interested in in the future. Um, I worked on several projects during this summer, some big projects including TIF reform with Emily. I worked on the free expression, First Amendment project, which you're going to see in the presentation shortly. I also worked on a couple of citizen projects, including assisting with FOIA requests or answering questions about them, um, signatures for petitions and referendums, helping like, get the correct format for them. And um, yeah, this is Emily, my colleague. I will introduce introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I am a second year law student, so I'm one year behind Sara. Um, I'm at Loyola University, and I have been at CAC since February, and I've gotten to work on a lot of different projects, some of them with you in here tonight, which is great. Um, and also got to work on TIF, which I presented last week on that, and some of you were there for that. Um, free expression, which I'm excited to share with you today. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. All right, so today we will discuss one of the most shared aspects of our Constitution. The cornerstone of democracy, which is free speech or free expression, and it's guaranteed by the First Amendment. So we will begin our presentation by talking about landmark cases in the Supreme Court that established the definition of free speech, defined protected speech versus unprotected speech, set boundaries between um, what speech constitutes protection and what's not, what not, set precedents. Then we will go to recent Supreme Court cases that follow these precedents or establish newer precedents. After that, we will have an interactive component where we will provide you with scenarios and ask you to answer them based on the information we provided you. We ask everyone to engage, to keep, it, to keep the discussion fun and lively. And um, after that, we will, I will pass it over to Emily, who will talk about the vulnerable groups that get left behind with the current free speech laws. And she'll also talk about potential free speech approaches. We invite you to join the discussion and share your thoughts. So since we're talking about free speech, it's only right to start with reading the First Amendment straight from the Constitution. So let's read it together. Congress shall make no law respecting the of religion or forbidding the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for Thank you everyone for reading it with me. <laughs> Starting with um, landmark, sorry. Okay. So we're going to start with landmark cases from the Supreme Court. So one of the so they're based, the First Amendment has plenty of Supreme Court cases that establish where it is today. However, we picked a few that are um, related to the material that we're going to be discuss today, discussing today. So one of the cases that we picked out is Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. This case defined what fighting words mean. So in this case, the defendant, Chaplinsky, was distributing literature and decided to call a state marshal a racketeer and a fascist. He was convicted for offensive public speech. He challenged his conviction, saying that it's infringing and violating his First Amendment. The Supreme Court upheld his conviction stating that him calling a state marshal a racketeer and a fascist is in fact fighting words because it was directed towards that state marshal. Therefore, it was not protected speech. So his conviction was upheld. The second case is Tinker versus Des Moines, which, Des Moines, which is um, a case that established where students' freedom of speech lies, particularly in public school. So in this case, what essentially happened is that the students wanted to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War, and they did. When the school principal found about it, she threatened to suspend them. However, the student disregarded that uh, like threat to suspend and still wore the armband, so the, the principal suspended them. The parents brought a suit on behalf of the minors, saying that the suspension was unconstitutional and violated their free speech in First Amendment. 
The court agreed. The Supreme Court stated that students are not expected to lose their constitutional right of free speech at the gates of the school or as soon as they get to the school. And the school is not expected to restrict speech unless it substantially and materially infringes on the education process of another student. This case drew the line of where speech can be restricted when it infringes on another student's educational process. Um, a popular case that many of you might know because it established a well-known standard is the Brandenburg versus Ohio case, which established the standard of clear and present danger test. So in this case, um, Clarence Brandenburg, who was a KKK leader, at a rally made some remarks and said that the government is suppressing white Caucasians, um, so Caucasian race. And he was convicted under Ohio law, which made it illegal to advocate crime and violence. Brandenburg didn't like that. He challenged the law and he said that, this, he said that it's violating his freedom of speech. Guess what, the Supreme Court agreed with him and said that in fact, that law is violating his freedom of speech. Why? Because it established a standard from this case saying that the state can only restrict speech if it incites imminent lawless action and is likely to produce such action. Finally, the last landmark case that we'll be discussing today is RIV versus City uh, of St. Paul. This is a case about a juvenile who thought it was, would be a fun idea maybe to burn a cross on a black family's lawn. And as a result, was arrested for using hate symbols because he violated an ordinance that prohibited that. The Supreme Court ruled, surprisingly, that that ordinance did violate, in fact, his First Amendment and his hate speech was protected because hate speech based on race, color, creed, or religion, or gender were unconstitutional and it protected such speech. So going over the rules and outcome of each of these cases that we discussed, starting with Chaplinsky. So the rule was speech must be intended or directed at a person to constitute a fighting word. Chaplinsky in this case directed the speech to state marshal and he intended it towards him. Therefore, it fell under the fighting words concept and it was unprotected speech. The outcome was that this upheld, the outcome is that it was upheld the state law restricting offensive speech, calling a state official fascist and a racketeer does not constitute protected speech. The second case, Stinker versus Des Moines, it, the rule states that there must be material and substantial destruction of the education process or speech infringes on the rights of another for the government or for the school to regulate activity. Which is exactly what happened here. Wearing an on-brand by the students did not substantially disrupt or infringe on the educational right of any other student which means that their activity was within their confines of protected speech and the First Amendment, so the suspension was unconstitutional and they were allowed to wear the armband to school. The court ruled that wearing, the outcome is that the court ruled that the wearing an armband was not destructive and the First Amendment protected the students. The other case, which is Brandon Murray versus Ohio, the rule that, established, that is established from it is that the First Amendment allows states to restrict speech advocating force or law break breaking only if it aims to incite imminent illegal action and is likely to do so. Focus on incite imminent illegal action because that is the core of this rule that if an action incites this action, it incites an illegal action, that's when it, become, it falls under unprotected speech. As long as it's not, as long as it's just plain speech, then it's not inciting no matter how unpleasant it is. What um, Brandenburg in this case says exactly, if you look at the bottom here, it says, in his speech he says, if our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court continues to suppress the white Caucasian race, it's possible that there might have to be some revenge taken. It's just according to the Brandenburg versus Ohio uh, test, and according to the Supreme Court, this was just pure speech, did not incite any violence, and did not incite any legal action, therefore it was protected speech. And he had, the outcome was that he had the right to say it. Finally, the last landmark case that 
we will be talking about before moving to recent Supreme Court, uh, court cases is the um, RAV versus City of St. Paul. And the rule from this case states that under First Amendment, states cannot regulate unprotected speech like fighting words based on what it is. There's an important distinction between this case and Chapulinski, which is the first case, the fighting words case. This case was after Chapulinski, and actually in determining this case, the standard from Chapulinski, which is the fighting words, was used. The difference is that here, when the juvenile was burning the cross, he wasn't intending and directing it toward this family that he was burning the cross, that owned the lawn. He was just doing it there. Compared to Chaplinsky, he, he called the state marshal a racketeer and a fascist. He intended it and directed it towards him. And that's where the difference is. It's a very thin line, but that's where the difference is. And that's why this speech was protected and the other was not. The outcome of this case was the ordinance was unconstitutional on its face because it bans speech only on topics it covered, even if the speech was otherwise allowed. Now we're going to move to recent Supreme Court cases. And this is a case that many of you might have heard about it, National Rifle Association of America versus Bolo. Um, it was one of the most anticipated free speech cases this year. It started in 2018. So what happened is that National Rifle Association, known as NRA, alleged that the superintendent, Maria Villo, was violating their First Amendment by using her position to coerce regulated entities to dissociate with them and with other gun advocacy groups. Essentially what she was doing as a superintendent was meeting with entities and advising them and telling them not to associate with NRA, but given her position, as a superintendent, it was seen more as coercive because she's in a powerful position. So they brought a suit against her. When they brought a suit against her, Bolo argued that his allegations did not rise to the level of unconstitutional coercion. Uh, what the Supreme Court held in this case it, is that the First Amendment prohibits government officials from holding their power selectively to punish or suppress speech, including through private intermediaries and a government official may not suppress expression regardless of whether it is accomplished through direct or indirect means. And this is what she was essentially claiming about indirect means, about how she was meeting with them and conducting an investigation, saying that it's within her job purview. However, it was an indirect means of coercion, according to the Supreme Court. The next case is Scatterman versus Colorado. So this case is about someone named Billy Counterman who woke up one day and thought it was a good idea to send unpleasant messages. Sorry, I, didn't, I did not know this, so I didn't move that. There we go. So he thought it was a good idea to just send unpleasant messages on Facebook to this musician. Um, the messages were threatening, a little bit stalkerish, included details of her whereabouts, what she was doing, what she was wearing, which left her frightened and feeling threatened. She wished she had to change her daily routine, cancel out plans related to her career. And she finally contacted authorities. Then Counterman was convicted under Colorado law that criminalizes repeated communications causing serious emotional distress. When he was convicted, Counterman argued that his messages were protected by the First Amendment and not true threats. So they shouldn't lead to criminal charges. So what the Supreme Court held is that in the First Amendment, true threats cases, true threats cases the prosecution must, must show the defendant understood their statement to be seen as threats. <coughs> the proper standard to use is recklessness. Recklessness is when a person intentionally knows what he's doing could lead to potential harmful effects, but still does it willfully. Um, the case, as for counterman, the case was remanded for further proceeding. And the last su recent Supreme Court case that we will discuss, it's not a Supreme Court case, sorry, it's a relevant case from Ohio. Um, it's about also a very popular case that so some people might have heard about it, Cooley versus Foreman, AKA Ackerman. So this is about a rapper who the cops conducted a destructive search in his house and his wife was recording. And so were many surveillance and security cameras. After the search was recorded, Ackerman or Foreman decided to do a rap music video and include that footage, thinking it would be a good idea. Obviously, the cops were not 
not going to let that slide by, so they sued him, saying that he was benefiting on, his, on their behalf and they were defame and that he was defaming them. What the court held in this case is that it dismissed the officer's claim of right of publicity and authorized use of persona. The court justified its decision by stating that public servants like the officers in question should expect criticism as part of their role. And that was alleged, that was essentially what they were challenging is that Foreman was criticizing them in their in their job while they were conducting their job. They're doing their job as police officers, and he should have not done that. But the court said yes, they should cops should and public officials should expect that type of criticism. However, the court allowed a defamation claim to proceed. And what, what it, this did essentially is that it limited protection, acknowledge, it acknowledged the limited protections that public officials have against public criticism. This case was important because it balances out public interest with individual privacy interests of public officials. So it drew a line. True, it did let Ackerman continue with his case about his, with his video that had police officers <coughs> doing the search, but it didn't allow him to defame them, make false accusations, or make false claims in the video. This case is a, a good transition to what we're going to do because it shows how the court can draw a line where protected and unprotected speech lies. And now we have reached the part, mostly anticipated in this presentation, which is where we're going to provide you with scenarios. And from these scenarios, we will ask you to answer based on what we just showed you, the Supreme Court cases, the landmark cases, and the recent cases, what the Supreme Court is likely to rule based on what we just talked about. So what's going to happen is I'll ask everybody to participate. If you believe that the Supreme Court would rule it as protected speech, thumbs up. If you believe that it would rule it as unprotected speech, thumbs down. And then we're going to go through the explanation for why each <coughs> one of them is protected versus unprotected. Are we ready? Yeah. Oh, let's go over it. Alright, first scenario. So at a political rally, an individual stands up and loudly proclaims, I hate immigrants. They are a threat to our way of life and are taking away our jobs. The individual goes on to suggest that immigrants should be isolated from society and banned from public services. The speech creates tension in the crowd. Do you, would the Supreme Court rule this as protected or unprotected speech? Thumbs up for protected, thumbs down for unprotected. Oh, everybody said protected. Okay. Everybody's right. Look at you guys. I guess I'm a great teacher then. <laughs> Student's right, so it is 
that, yeah, it does. That's, that's what the Supreme Court says. It, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it, like, uh, it's, it doesn't, it's not considered a distraction. So that's what the Supreme Court case would hold in this case, that it's protected. Mm -hmm. Moving to the third scenario, an individual erects a large swastika <coughs> in a public park, citing it as an artistic expression and critique of censorship. The swastika comes after an uptick in anti-Semitic hate crimes in the city. The city has an ordinance banning symbols that protect hatred. With the Supreme Court, this as protected or unprotected speech. <laughs> I see most people are saying unprotected. It's protected speech. <laughs> it is protected speech, and um, the case that directly relates this is the RAV versus City of St. Paul, which struck down hate speech ordinance on the grounds that it was impermissible content regulation of speech. If this, however, with this case, is that if the city can demonstrate that the symbol incites imminent lost lawless action or constitutes a true threat, then maybe the court might allow some regulation under Brennan Jr. versus Ohio. But other than that, it's considered protected. <coughs> and our last scenario for today, um, an individual posts on social media explicitly calling for violent acts against a specific racial or religious group, including Detailed plans for attacks and instructions for assembling weapons. Unprotected or protected? I see everyone saying unprotected. I don't see anybody saying protected, right? Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. It is unprotected speech. So this case, the reason why it's unprotected speech is because the instructions to assemble weapons and detailed plan of the attacks, I mean, if that doesn't constitute inciting violence, what would? It is inciting violence, therefore it is not protected speech under the Brandenburg versus Ohio standard. Um, these are posts that are held before immediate violence. All right, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Emily to talk about where we draw the line. Okay? Even if the hate speech wasn't directly towards them. 
So it affects us all. Whippage and mileage from 2022 found that exposure to hate speech predicted PTSD and depression symptoms. A very direct harm. The third is Vasily from 2016. They found that homophobic epithets, which are essentially slurs, foster dehumanization and avoidance of gay people. Another clear harm. Mullen and Smith from 2004 found that suicide rates among ethnic immigrant groups could be predicted by the hate speech directed towards those ethnic immigrant groups. So they could actually predict, predict the suicide rates based on how much hate speech that ethnic immigrant group suffered from. So hate speech <coughs> poses a real harm to the people who have to suffer from it, okay? But hate speech also is a precursor for hate crime. We've seen this historically. For example, the Holocaust did not start with gas chambers, but with hate speech against minorities. This is coming from the UN. They have a whole um, report on this, but the Nazi party came to power in 1933, but the industrialized mass killing of Jewish people didn't begin until 1941. So what happened in the meantime? Well, they laid the groundwork for the Holocaust. So in between 1933 and 1941, the Nazi party produced media that disseminated hate speech, anti-Semitic and racist stereotypes, and disinformation and lies. So they normalized atrocity crimes through hate speech. Now let's look a bit closer to home in the U.S. and more recent. Maybe some of you have heard about Dylan Roof, who killed nine African American congregants at a South Carolina church in 2015. Um, the Washington Post uh, reported that he was a self-radicalized, self-professed white supremacist. Officials found a manifesto online belonging to Roof that was filled with racist characterizations of black people and others. Should we have done something before this atrocity took place? That's the question we're asking today. And hate speech, or hate crimes, are on the rise in the US. So this is from the FBI hate crime uh, data. So that's collected from 14,631 law enforcement agencies. That's out of 1,800. So essentially 81% of our law enforcement agencies report their hate crime statistics to the FBI for this. Um, and that covers about 91% of the US population. Okay, so that's what's covering in this data here. And we can see from 2021 to 2022, there was almost a thousand more hate crime incidents. So in 2021, we had 10,875 incidents of hate crime in the US. And in 2022, we had 11,613 incidents of hate crime. So it is rising and it has been rising. They also break it down by bias types. So hate crime is most common against, based on race and ethnicity. So at 56.6% are based on race and ethnicity. 17.3% is based on religion. 16.8% uh, is based on sexual orientation. 4.9, gender and gender identity. Three, multiple bias, so a multiple combination of these, and then 1.5% is based on disability. So that's what the FBI is currently reporting for hate crime statistics. And then they also break it down by the top bias type, so the top groups that experience hate crimes the most. And these are anti-black hate crimes, anti-Jewish hate crimes, and anti-gay men hate crimes. These are the most common. We also have seen, since 2020, an unprecedented increase in hate crimes against trans and non-binary people, and that's reported from the Human Rights Campaign. So, what have we seen here? We've seen that hate speech itself causes harm. We've seen that hate speech is a precursor to hate crimes. And we've seen that hate crimes are significantly increasing in the US. So, what <coughs> triggers hate crimes, what are instigators? One of those is catalytic events. So the Equality and Human Rights Commission reported that one of the main instigators of hate crime are significant national or international events that spark violent reactions by those who see their very existence as coming under threat. 
Examples of these are the 9-11 attacks, the London bombings of, the, of 2005, the Paris attacks of 2015, and now October 7th, 2023. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the events of October 7th, 2023, but essentially uh, Hamas attacked Israel in, on October 7th, and since then there's been um, a huge conflict. And in the, um, in the uh, moments since then, we've seen a huge rise in hate in the US from after October 7th. So the Council on American Islamic Relations reported a 178% rise in anti-Muslim complaints compared to the same period from a year earlier. The Anti-Defamation League reported U.S. anti-Semitic incidents rose by 360% compared to the prior year. So we've seen an increase in hate against both groups, both Jewish and Muslim um, people are suffering, okay? And we've seen this close to home with real people in our communities. Um, I'm sure some of you heard about what happened to Wadia, uh, a six-year-old boy who was a victim of an anti-Muslim hate crime on October 14th. And we know from the Washington Post that before the events of October 7th, the perpetrator actually had a good relationship with Rudia and his family, actually built a tree house for Rudia. And then after what happened on October 7th, he murdered Rudia. He told, before he uh, perpetrated the murder, he told Rudia's mom that he was angry at her for what was going on with Israel. And then he stabbed Rudia and he stabbed her, his mom. Also, there have been attacks of Jewish people as well. There was a Jewish man attacked in, in Chicago after a screening of the documentary about the Hamas attack, according to ABC Chicago. So hate is affecting our community. It's affecting real people. So where should we draw the line? That's the question we're asking. If our goal is to foster a society of freedom and tolerance, we need to strike a balance between freedom of expression and freedom from discrimination and hate. So what does that look like? Does our current system already strike the proper balance? Maybe you think so. That's totally fair. But some of you, especially after those scenarios that Sar went through with us, might be asking maybe we should be taking a different approach. So we do have an example of a different approach. Um, so the Rabat threshold test comes from um, the UN and they essentially had a group of people come together and create the perfect kind of balancing test, and by perfect I mean as perfect as you can get with these things, um, and they, they created a balancing test that can kind of weigh between these two things, okay? So what would that mean? We would essentially move from the imminent danger true threat test that Sara has made you all experts on we would move towards a balancing test. So we would balance different factors, which I'll go through in a second, against each other to determine whether the speech should be protected or if it's just simply too dangerous and harmful to protect. Okay, so let's go through some of the factors from the robot standard. The first factor is context. Everything has context, just like Kamala Harris told us with her coconut tree, right? So, social and political context is important to determine its danger to the target group, right? If we're in a community where there has been a significant increase in crimes against a certain group, and then there's speech against that group, that's going to land completely different than if someone is speaking out of hand with no background, no context related to it, right? It's going to have a different impact. The next is the speaker. Who's talking? Are they powerful? Do they have sway? It's a totally different thing when I'm talking than even Jack, our executive director. You're all gonna take Jack's words over mine, right? Maybe not Jack, maybe. Uh, the sway of Trump versus Kamala is gonna have a totally than if Carter, my husband, were to get up and tell you the same thing, right? Totally different. The speaker matters. The intent, 
is exactly how it sounds. What was the intention of the speaker? Why did they say what they said? It's important to consider the content and form. The more provocative the language is, such as using known slurs, the more likely the speech can incite retaliation, incite violence, right? What is said also matters. The extent of its dissemination. Right now I'm talking to a group of people, right? This is a higher level of dissemination than if I was to say the same things in the comfort of my own home, right? The more people we're talking to, the more people that hear the speech or see the speech matters. And finally, the likelihood of harm. This is somewhat similar to the Brandenburg test. It's a little different though because we're thinking about harm rather than lawless action. I think the robot standard does a good job of describing this. This is the reasonable probability that the speech would succeed in inciting actual action against the target group. Okay? So those are our factors. Let's apply them. We're gonna do three of the scenarios that SAR went through, and we're gonna apply these factors. So I'm gonna read it again. At a political rally, an individual stands up loudly and proclaims, I hate immigrants. They are a threat to our way of life and are taking away our jobs. The individual then goes on to suggest that immigrants should be isolated from society and banned from public services. The speech creates a palpable tension in the crowd. So instead of applying the US standard, we're gonna apply to the robot factors right now. First, context. Well, we don't know that much context in this fact pattern, but what is the climate of the rally? Is this with a group of people that believe similarly and might take action when hearing these words? Or is it out of nowhere and no one cares what this person's saying, right? That's probably not the case because it creates palpable tension, but we have to consider these things. And has there been an increase in violence in this area that this is happening in? The speaker, who was this individual? We don't know from these facts, but if this speaker had a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of people that took what they said um, for reality, then that might be different than if Joe Schmo says the same thing in a rally, right? So who says it would matter here? We don't know. The intent, did the speaker intend for violence or harm to immigrants? Well, here they don't specifically say that they want violence to happen, but they do suggest that immigrants should be isolated from society and banned from public services. I think we can all agree that they intend harm, right? That would be a real harm to immigrants. So we can, we can say that for sure with this fact pattern. The content. Here, there's no slurs used, but I think we can also agree that this is extremely provocative language to suggest that immigrants should be isolated from our society and banned from public services. This is definitely provocative language that definitely could incite some retaliation, right? The extent. Well, we know this is at a rally. People have heard. We know this. And we also know that it's created palpable tension in the crowd. So there is a high level of dissemination with this one. So that would definitely play a role when we're balancing these factors. And last, the likelihood of harm. While there's no calls to harm or violence in this case, remember, we have to think of harm a bit more broadly. I mean, look at the harm, all the data that suggests that these kind of words have real harm to people. And this is quite a statement. We've already been through that, to isolate from society, ban from public services. I think it's safe to say that this would cause some people some harm. So this is the first scenario. This might be how a court would balance these factors if we were to um, use these factors as our law. Let's look at scenario two a little bit quicker. So a student at a public university creates and distributes a pamphlet containing racially offensive language and pseudoscientific claims that certain races are genetically predisposed to criminal behavior. The pamphlet sparks intense campus debates, protests, and minority students are feeling unsafe. Okay, again, content and form. What is the climate of the university? Has there been an increase in violence against minority students? This is the context that we would need to know to determine this. The speaker, the speaker here, we know it's a student. Students tend to not have that much power and sway, but you never know. Maybe the student is head of an organization and actually a lot of people listen to them. 
We don't know in this case, but likely the speaker doesn't have as much power as somebody who is in a, a position of power, like administrative or something. The intention. Did the, the speaker intend for violence or harm to minorities? Here, uh, while they, again, they don't, they don't call to harm, they don't call to violence, but uh, we, can, we can say that there is harm when you say racially offensive language, when we say there's pseudoscientific claims, genetically predisposed to criminal behavior. We can, we can safely assume that the intention here was to call, to cause some form of harm towards minorities in this case. The content, here again, no slurs were used necessarily, but this is very provocative and very demeaning language, as I think we all can agree. The extent, here the distribution was throughout the university, and it clearly had an effect on the university. So it had a high level of dissemination, which would play a role. And lastly, the likelihood of, ha of harm. Again, there's no calls for violence or harm here, but I think we can all agree that these kind of claims, these kind of words would have a real harm on people if we're thinking about harm in the way that we went through with those studies that we showed you. Okay. Last but not least, the third scenario, an individual erects a large swastika in a public park, citing it as an artistic expression and a critique of censorship. The swastika comes after an uptick in anti-Semitic hate crimes in the city, and the city has an ordinance banning symbols that promote hatred. So again, the context here, um, here there's a clear climate of violence in the city, creating a more dangerous environment for something like a swastika to be put up. We know that there's been anti-Semitic hate crimes, so these kind of uh, symbols would incite a lot more of a reaction than if there hadn't been anti-Semitic hate crimes already. The speaker, we don't know who this individual was. Um, they put up a symbol, so they're not speaking necessarily, um, like literally, um, but it would matter. Were they someone with power and sway? Do people know who the person that posted it was? We don't know, but it would play a role. The intent. Did the speaker intend for violence or harm to Jewish people? I think here we can all agree that a swastika, with all of the context that a swastika holds, they were likely intending some sort of harm, if not violence, towards Jewish people, especially when we take into account the context of when this is taking place. The content, again, we've, we've been through this. This is very <coughs> provocative imagery. A lot of history definitely would play a role here. The extent, this is erected in a public place for all to see. High levels of dissemination. A lot of people are seeing it. And the likelihood of harm. So no calls to harm or violence again, but with the current context of violence and the provocativeness of the, of the imagery, it could be more likely here. Okay, so. We went through some scenarios. We've applied the factors. Hopefully we now have a good idea of how the US would handle these type of scenarios and how a different approach, a balancing test might handle them. So now we're asking the question is, what do you think? Does the US's current system already strike the right balance? Maybe you think so, that's fair. Or some of you might be thinking maybe we should move to something that considers more than just imminent danger or truth threats? Or are there other ways to adapt? This is an open question. Can you take it over? Oh, you don't want that. Thank you both. Excellent job. So, uh, who, who wants to start off the, the group discussion now that you've seen where the U.S. law lies on free speech and free expression. We've uh, shown you an alternative way of analyzing free speech fact patterns. We're not asking you necessarily to talk about the U.S. standard or the robot standard. We are asking what you think. What, where do you think the line should be drawn? Or give us an example of something that you think might be protected under the U.S. law that shouldn't be, or something that isn't protected that maybe should be. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the cross burning on someone's home. It's a, was that because I think it was this? So I'm if somebody, you know, 
puts a cross on my neighbor. I think it is just a neighbor, not for me. And for private property. I'm a little confused. Private property. Plus, at the bottom, it said there was a city ordinance. Yeah, so they. Look, you know, you, like, you especially if that was a bird is near. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Yeah, so uh, for the private property, so if we're looking at free expression, um, it's different than thinking about private property. There may, have, there may have been something related to private property, like a trespassing claim. So that's a different consideration than free speech, so that could have been something. Um, and what was the other concern? The, the, one, the last thing on that slide was that there was a city ordinance again. Yes, yes, so that's... Of Yes, yes, so that is actually what the, the Supreme Court was ruling on. They actually said that that ordinance was unconstitutional yeah. based on content. Does that make sense? So Does it mean they banned it or they didn't? So the ordinance banned that form of speech. The Supreme Court ruled that yeah. that ordinance was unconstitutional. So they cannot ban that form of speech. So, yeah. yeah. So if I may add to yep. what Emily was saying, essentially about this case, which is the RAB versus City of St. Paul, the reason why this, according to the Supreme Court, why this ordinance was unconstitutional is because it was the content, the content of it, which is the cross burning, and it wasn't like directed towards someone. That was the reasoning. That was the main difference between it and Chapman's case. So it's kind of a hairly split. What's that? And a hair is split here. Yeah, so yeah, they, that's, they, they ruled that ordinance. The city had that ordinance, but that ordinance was found unconstitutional because of its content and it violated. I think a lot of people in this room remember the March on School. Yeah, so for those who may be unfamiliar, Nancy brought up the, I think it was 1980, 81, something like that. Um, there was a, an effort by the Nazi Party of Illinois, which I think still exists. Um, to, to march in Skokie, Illinois, which has a disproportionately high population of Jewish citizens. Um, when you're thinking about the factors of Rabat, it doesn't take a lot of mental gymnastics to assume that a group of Nazis whose entire ideology is based in anti-Semitism, choosing a high population Jewish community as a marching ground, uh, <laughs> doesn't you know? It, 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 you don't have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to get to the point where you think they're probably trying to start something, right. Mm -hmm. right? They're not necessarily interested only in explaining their philosophy and giving us scientific evidence to support what they have to say. That being said, the Supreme Court protected the right of the Nazis to march in Skokie. Uh, that's a case we all learn about in law school. But that, again, that, that shows you where the U.S. is on First Amendment. And the ACLU defended the Nazis. That's correct. The ACLU is also, uh, was also in support of this interpretation of free speech. So, so you, you, would, you would fall on the... ACLU side. Of the AC, well, also the Supreme Court side, right? I... I think it's a, it's a dangerous road to, to suppress speech in any way, no matter how foul or disgusting. And okay. I think there are rules in place, and it's in my personal experience, especially recently, that the rules aren't applied. So if you, if you, if you take what's there and you use it, there's no need to change it. But if you ignore it and say, oh, no, that's okay, <coughs> get over it. It's okay. Anyone want to? A, <laughs> remind me not to walk in for you. Remind me not to walk in front of the scene again. <laughs> um, does anyone have an, a, 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 an opposite view from Nancy? Does anyone think differently that maybe Nazis should not be allowed to march in Skokie or put swastikas up in a public space? Go ahead, remind me of your name. That's a, it's a different perspective. Go ahead. Which says, it's a classic statement that the proper response to bad speech is more speech. And that's hard to do, but it was suggested at the time of the march in Skokie that a better response, and partly it was done, that people turn out and turn their backs on the Nazis and outnumber them, and that that would have been louder speech. And 
That is true in a lot of instances. Now, it's difficult to do that because you don't have the same access to the location and time and so on of the original speech. But in the discussion of media earlier, it certainly is an obligation of truthful media to allow that more speech to counteract the bad speech. So as far as where you fall on the on the line, right? Because the, the idea behind the presentation is where is the line drawn? <coughs> would, you, would you suggest that the line should include the type of speech we've been discussing, the Skokie speech, for example? I tend toward being a First Amendment absolutist. Mm -hmm. ah, yes. I believe that any symbolic uh, statement whether visual or whatever, <coughs> needs to be responded to by counter-information, not by suppression. Okay, uh, anyone, uh, let's, anyone that has a different view, that, that thinks that, that the First Amendment should not protect the speech that we've been discussing, is there anyone out there that has that view? Go ahead. You know, I think it comes down to how much harm is being done. So you don't yell, Fire in a crowded movie theater. Just real quick, that uh, fire in a crowded movie theater is Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, <laughs> it's a justice from the turn of the previous century whose life defining experience was fighting in the Civil War. And he had an approach to life and to jurisprudence that was very dark and not necessarily looking favorably upon human nature. I think his experience made him think that we we are naturally inclined towards savagery and kind of articulated the, the basic foundation of the free speech universe that we live in today. He was kind of the intellectual godfather of the absolutist approach of over 100 years ago. But he's most famous for, I don't even remember the, the case. Does anyone know the case of the fire and crowded theater case? What, what's that? There wasn't. It wasn't a case? Okay. Well, he's famous for saying, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. What, 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 he, what we don't include is that what he meant to say, or maybe he did, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater if there's no fire. Right? And, and, and part, of, part, of the, part of the issue there is that you can't just lie and cause a bunch of chaos. Um, that being said, his quote which, which makes it sound like he's in favor of restricting speech, does, it kind of belies the fact that he essentially is the founding father of the free speech mechanism, or, or framework, rather, that US law has today. So thank you for bringing that up. Go ahead, continue. Were you, was that well, it? no, it's just that uh, it's a question of where the line is. He drew it at, at saying, that's what he uses as an example to say, here's the line. And maybe that line in modern day is a different place in different ways. And do you think, do you, or would you suggest that we should move that line? Yeah, I think there's a lot of real bad harm being done because of disinformation and misinformation, as well as that hate speech. Um, and at some point, you know, people have to be held accountable for the impact of their statements. I think you have to go back to the news. Oh, I'm so, so sorry, Nancy. Let's, oh, I just want to make sure we're getting everybody in. Yvonne, go ahead. Um, I've had a lot of experience with, with all of this stuff. Um, I was in the riots in 1968 in Washington, D.C. And, um, and of course, it was during the Vietnam War. Um, and the way the troops were treated when they came back to town um, was absolutely horrible. And then I had occasion to go to the cemetery, the National Cemetery, and um, what found out that there were uh, soldiers who were Wiccan. They, they actually practiced their religion as Wiccan, and they could not have the Wiccan symbol on their tombstone. 
So, you know, I've seen too much of speech being restricted and too much speech. Every, everybody in this room can say something that I'm going to find offensive or one of you is going to find offensive. You might find it offensive just, just because I'm talking. So if we start saying Not that, yet, Mom. All of this, <laughs> but if you start saying that you're going to limit all of that, uh, then we're, you know, how can we ever say that we're going to get along? Because, you know, all the blonde jokes, I can't tell you how many blonde jokes I've heard and how many Polish jokes and how many Italian jokes. They just hit three on me. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> see, see uh, so I think maybe what, rather than regulate and, and cause more regulation, what we need to do is grow some stamina and realize that, you know, if we just don't take offense at all of this stuff, and we just look at them and say, well, that guy's doing a stupid job, you know, and, and walk away. Don't pay any attention to it. What? I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to cut anyone off. I just want to make sure we're getting everybody. Alderman Irby, I want you to go next. This is uh, Alderman from Ward 3? Seven. Seven, sorry. And uh, right here at the City of Auburn. I think if we look at the historical reference, to the swastika, we're talking Nazis, the swastika, whatever scenario that was. Obviously, we can look over at Germany, we can jump over the pond and see what their current law is. And obviously, they've moved their detriment to society or the weight mm -hmm. of the harm. They moved that as a society decided to move it, and they did it, and they crafted laws as such. And we're over here, on, we have probably a good X number of standard deviations from that line in the sand where we are today. <coughs> so I would think that a careful analysis of what makes the difference, a gap analysis between where we are today and what made Germany decide that would probably give us some good light on the harm of the swastika because we have a population of 60 billion in Germany that's a pretty good sized population and we could make some evaluations from that to craft movement in the line of the sand that you were mentioning maybe we should move it or not but we should have a discussion and discourse as to what caused that to happen and i think we're living that here today in, in elmhurst i don't know if you guys realize it but we've had swastikas show up in the last year prevalent and repeated efforts that are happening right here within a quarter mile or less showing up on on things and it's causing people to to get nervous, afraid. So I I don't know if I want to move the sand yet, but I want to talk about it. How's that? So two responses to that and then I want our founder to weigh in. Um, one, thank you for bringing up the comparative part because if if we, were, if we were all going to sit here and, and, and in this room decide, as a group, we get to set the line, we get to draw the line, we have to come to a consensus on what First Amendment law should protect or shouldn't, it would be, uh, it would be a waste of our time if we did not look at what other nations, other people, other communities across the world are doing. Germany is a great example. Another wonderful example is South Africa in the wake of apartheid when Nelson Mandela was elected in 1994, they went through this entire process of truth and reconciliation, where they designed their constitution to legalize the system of equity that the African National Congress had been calling for for the better part of 40 years. And their hate crime and their hate speech language looks very, very different from what it looks like here. Um, that's not to say better or worse, it's just different. And if we're considering uh, opening this discussion again that hasn't really been opened much since Oliver Wendell Holmes has been on the bench, then, then it behooves us to know and educate ourselves about other uh, histories. Um, I have another point, and I almost I lost it. And I was doing so well. <laughs> um, Okay, maybe. Must not have been important. <laughs> Teresa, you're on. Okay, I actually have a question at, at two tidbits of Citizen Advocacy Center history. Um, back in the 90s, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was um, marching in DuPage County. And uh, a group of people, uh, we, had, we had represented um, several uh, uh, Hispanics uh, in Addison in a, in a landmark fair housing case. And we decided, along with, and I, we didn't decide, the, uh, the uh, 
that's fun. And have their uh, festival of music in a, while and or right after the uh, KKK scholars. That's a perfect example of more speech, right? Yes. yes. And I, I also think that, um, and I have a question for the interns too, but I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we invited Mary Beth Tinker, the plaintiff in Tinker versus Des Moines, who spoke uh, to the center and community, you know, the communities. Um, uh, I want to say about 15 years ago, but my memory is hazy. Uh, but, That's um, very cool. And I, I think what I remember about that case, and I'm not sure, but I think she lost um, in the first two rounds of the court, and and at the district court level and the circuit court, or the appellate court level. And so uh, it was only that because they persevered in their belief that it was students' rights to be able to keep their constitutional rights within the, the schoolhouse gates that they won. Because um, a lot of people give up, <coughs> especially when they're frowned upon by so many. Uh, question to the interns, and maybe this is a bit unfair uh, to the college ones, uh, but everybody might have an opinion on this. Is there a way we could work out uh, some of the pension for, first of all, a historical and uh, lots of precedent on absolutism and the and free speech, and it's not absolute. There's lots of cases where it's not. Uh, and say, okay, you're really adamant about saying your hateful speech, but you should know it does cause harm. Can we have a situation where, if you believe that for every harm there should be some sort of redress in the law, could you address the harm in a different way through tort rather than through constitutional speech? That's for the law students, and you have a Emily, Sarah? Yes, yeah, Emily. Yeah, there, there actually is a movement towards that. Um, and there are arguments made for, um, you know, free, free speech uh, cases, if they know they're not going to necessarily be successful on the Supreme Court level versus for criminal, then maybe they should pursue tort and, and potentially get damages. Um, yeah, uh, do you want to have anything to add? No, I have what tort is. To oh. Tort. Yeah, see, I remember, yeah, remember I, 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 I gave them a warning. I said, this is not a lawyer thing, y'all. This, this is regular people. We can't do the law thing. The so. funny thing is, I've only been in law school for a year, and I went to orientation not knowing what a tort is. And I, I don't think any of us know what a tort uh, is in orientation. A tort is just civil liability. So anyone can bring a tort claim if there's some sort of harm that you've suffered. Um, whereas criminal liability, you, that can only be brought by uh, the police. The people, the state, exactly. Um, so civil liability is how I can sue my husband um, for <laughs> harming me in some way. That's that's the way to do that, and that's what that's what we we call tort liability. Yeah, I don't have anything different from what Emily said in terms of that. Um, something that is interesting about how you were asking whether you can sue as a tort. My tort professor used to teach con law, so he always tried to connect these two. So he That's actually- Constitutional used, law. Con constitutional, I'm so sorry. Constitutional <laughs> law. So he used to connect these two. So he brought, he proposed that concept a lot of times. And yeah, I mean, pretty much what Emily said is that a lot of people can sue, try to sue for damages when their claim doesn't. So just to give some examples, it's like assault and battery is a tort, right? Um, negligence, intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is my personal favorite. Uh, th those are causes of action that you can sue to someone that you think caused those various harms to you. So, to, so what I think, Teresa, you're getting at is what if we propose a body of law where you can actually make a claim against somebody else or damages inflicted based on hate and all. But you have to prove actual harm. That's and I hurt my, and I hurt my feelings isn't necessarily going to be actual harm. So you could have a hundred people with hurt feelings and you're not going to get anywhere because you're not going to be able to prove that anyone was actually. Harmed. I think emotional distress. But, is well, but when we, the, I mean, the our studies. The, yeah, exactly. The argument could be made that you could move and you could. Consider there being real harm by by hate speech, for example, and you could draw the line to PTSD, to depression, to uh, suicidal thoughts, to things like things that are real tangible harms. But again, you'd still run into similar issues because people can can claim that. 
Um, and that's why they're, I mean, it goes back to IIED, I guess, too, but. That's yeah. intentional infliction of emotional distress. <laughs> yeah. So, so one quick point, and then we'll do conclus conclusory thoughts, and then we'll enjoy each other's company for the rest of the evening. So what, what we're living in now is a world where two major things have changed. Uh, from the Oliver Wendell Holmes period until now. One is we know about mental health. We didn't know about that 100 years ago. We didn't know about that 50 years ago. We didn't have diagnoses of actual mental health conditions. Not only do we have that information now, but we know from the studies that Emily took us through that mental health is health. Harm to one's mental health is harm. That was not part of the analysis before. Harm, I mean, you remember from Brandenburg, it's like likely to incite violence. That means, unless it's a direct expression of a likelihood to incite violence, there's no harm. We're now living in a world where we understand harm better. So, that's part of why we're having this discussion, is are we going to rethink this? The other thing that's changed is the diversity of the population. So you have a, a, a much wider array of groups that are vulnerable and susceptible to hate than we did in this country 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So we have to keep in mind, back to our Vice President's quote, we all didn't just fall out of a coconut tree, we are here in the context of that which came before us. And we're in the context of what's going on around us. So it is worth considering that maybe the standards we had 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, aren't necessarily the standards we should have now. That's all, we're only asking you to consider. So, does anyone else have some final thoughts? Uh, ideally someone who hasn't spoken yet. Can you, you tell me your name? Jean. Jean, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to mention, not a lawyer, but I remember women voters. Oh, great. And, um, My favorite organization after CAC. I don't, I don't know if, First of all, I know here in Elmhurst, we conducted a candidate forum that was, um, we had protesters who came in who, uh, at the you know, at the courthouse. Right. So we then, we, unfortunately, we're not prepared for that. Um, we have now learned that we generally have to have police presence if we want to have an in-person candidate forum. And we generally also um, are starting to do all of these things online so that we don't have instances like that, which is really sad. Um, I know that, for instance, probably 15 years ago, we used to have a lot of presentations because we had done a study on um, sensible gun rights and, um, and gun control. And if we were to announce those meetings as public meetings, the NRA would infiltrate it and take over our meeting. So there's just little instances locally that I see that you know, the things that you're talking about, we have to deal with every day, and many of us are not um, accustomed to that. And it's just, and I guess I would also mention to factors that you said um, are different nowadays. The other thing that's different nowadays is people feel they need weapons. And so many times people are just afraid to say anything to anybody else. Because you're not sure. But I mean, just getting angry driving down the road in a car and expressing yourself is no longer <laughs> acceptable. Thank you, Jane. I think it's a different world. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important point because we are not, CAC is not here to operate in a world of theory. CAC is here to operate in a world of actual reality. And, and to know, to connect what we talked about here with personal direct experience is exactly why we do this. So thank you for sharing that. Anything else from anyone else? I have a... Go ahead, go ahead. Say your name. You know, the first... One of the first few words we heard in this room was about truth. But in this scenario of free speech, that element of truth is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. There is another word, justice. It should be just. That is not seen. I mean, just a few points that I 
that work, I would know. The third point uh, is about that uh, structure being put in a public park. Is that allowed? Is that legal in the first place? Can anybody go to a park and put up a structure? No. Forget swastika. If you get permission. Only if you get permission. Not for the structure, but permission to put it up. Permission to put it up. You can, okay, so that, that should be. But if, uh, would, would, would they not ask what structure it is? That is surprising. I want to, I just want to put just a little friendly pushback because truth is not limited to provable facts. Truth includes everything we've talked about tonight. Every, every comment that everyone contributed to this discussion has a component of truth to it, right? Anyone that says, as soon as we start regulating Nazis, that's a slippery slope to regulating other groups. That's true. But we also have an argument as to why people are vulnerable, people could be harmed by letting speech go unchecked, which is also true. So I, I, I want to encourage us to think of truth as not just black, white, yes, no, but a large, part of a larger conversation. Teresa, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, it's hard to have the last word on truth, but <laughs> and, uh, what I wanted to talk about is go back to why we're here tonight and our fantastic uh, student interns. And Mary Beth Tinker was 13 years old when she wore her black armband in Des Moines, Iowa, which was the war. And oftentimes in the United States, it's students who make the change and do it somewhat fearlessly and not necessarily unified. Some people have one, one kind of uh, uh, idea, another person has another, and that's why we use, uh, hopefully, our judiciary rather than violence uh, to sort through some of these line drawing issues, uh, really difficult issues, issues where people are scared, like Mary Beth Tinker was, to take a stand. Some people won't even take a stand whether they like the left side of the room or the right side. Oh, I shouldn't say left and right, but you know, the yellow paint on the wall and the white, because they're so self-censored in part because when there's a climate of fear that prevents them from being able to speak. So I just want to say congratulations to all the interns. This is my favorite night of the year. The CSC has been doing this for 30 years, and there is lots of, <coughs> of public interest, deep, active, at least students who have thought about these ideas and then take it to wherever they go in the United States and around the world. You're part of that history. here at no cost to you, uh, but I will be honest and say that it is not free for us. <laughs> so uh, we do humbly ask you for a contribution. No amount is too small. Uh, we have the QR code available, which will run momentarily. So if you want to take your phone and scan it and make a donation, that way you can. Alternatively, if you want to, uh, we accept cash and check. Kathy Pope right here has the envelope for that. And we also have pledge cards on the table. If you feel like you have something you'd like to contribute, we can't do it today, um, please fill that out. Anyone that contributes in the next 24 hours or submits a pledge card in the next 24 hours will get a free copy of, drum roll someone. All right, all right, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Everyday Democracy, early edition. So, that's all, thank you. Please keep the rest of the food and uh, make sure we say hi on the way out.